you know, there's so much controversy about automation and robotics, and there's a fear that it's going to replace everybody's jobs. Is it going to upskill or de-skill people? Welcome to Series 2 of the Future Health Podcast, a podcast on the way we work, the work we do, and how technology will influence the future work in New South Wales Health and the healthcare industry. We have an incredible lineup of guests this series, and we're looking forward to sharing it with you soon. Feel free to like, share, and subscribe so you don't miss a thing. My guest today is Professor Karen Eggleston, Senior Fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute at Stanford University and Director of the Stanford Asia Health Policy Program. She's a leader in innovation for healthy aging and the impact of robotics. I'm really looking forward to discussing with her of how the future looks like in these settings. Hello, everyone. Um, our next guest is Professor Karen Eggleston from the Walter H. Sorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center. Um, thanks, Karen, for joining us today. And um, as you know, we're here today to talk about the future of health, um, the future of work, the workplace, and the worker. Um, one of your articles you recently uh, wrote really tweaked our interest the use of robotics in the aged care sector in Japan. And it really tweak the interest of a lot of us here to think about how do we see robotics change the way we work and the workplace of our future. Would you like to elaborate a bit on what you found in your recent studies? Sure. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, I have been working with colleagues in Japan and here at University of Tokyo, Atoshi Izuka and Yonsukli here at Stanford, jointly on a project looking at the adoption of robots for long-term care for the frail elderly in Japan. Um, and this is an important topic because, as you know, there's so much controversy about automation and robotics, and there's a fear that it's going to replace everybody's jobs. Is it going to upskill or de-skill people? And there's also a large potential for it to aid in um, healthcare and long-term care at home and in institutions. But it's not entirely clear how that trade-off is playing out over time. And since Japan, as you know, is sort of leading the world in this demographic transition of an older age structure, um, we thought it would be important to look there and see what they're actually doing on the ground. And um, for better or worse, Japan has many other demographic characteristics, for example, um, leading the world in many aspects of technology and not as open to immigration as many other societies are. And this dynamic leads to a large um, shortage of care, works, care workers in long-term care currently and projected. Um, and so one thing that made it an interesting setting to look at is that the government actually has been subsidizing um, both development of robots to a state assist caregivers and frail elderly with mobility and so on, and also um, subsidizing nursing homes to adopt those robots and use them in care. And so our study tried to look at that with um, data from nursing homes across Japan collected there by the ministry. Uh, and then we examined what kind of nursing homes were adopting, what kind of robots, and how that it was associated with things like their reported um, problems with attracting and retaining care workers. Um, and, you know, the research is ongoing. We've collected new um, data right before the pandemic hit, actually. Um, but the current study that you kindly mentioned, uh, based on data from 2017, actually already was finding some significant effects so that adoption of these robots went from, you know, very few, maybe 16% or so um, in the first wave where we had data in 2016 and was already quite a bit more, more than a quarter um, by 2017. And in our latest data was, you know, 60% of nursing homes. So rapid adoption of these robots. And, you know, um, some of the most common ones are to assist with monitoring, for example, to help um, perhaps to reduce um, caregivers need to go 
room to room uh, at night t- to check on people and also to um, provide mobility support. So there are some robots that assist caregivers, um, for example, to reduce the back pain they experience from having to move the clients around from bed to wheelchair and so on. So we looked at adoption of these different kinds of robots, and we're still looking at how it will be helping individuals, how it might impact quality of care. For now, the one thing we've found is that nursing homes that are adopting robots also report less problem with retaining caregivers. So that is a hopeful sign. There were some impacts on staffing. Um, And contrary to a lot of the um, narrative out there, we actually found using an instrumental variable strategy I won't go into, but we found that adoption of robots actually increased employment, uh, but it was on the non-regular or more part-time workers more than the full-time workers. And, you know, there were also impacts uh, and other aspects of staffing. So that's an overview of the motivation for the study and some of the results. It's it's quite interesting you highlight that because um, people outside, um, for us, it's almost sci-fi or, or fiction because you think, oh, yeah, this is what it's going to look like. But it seems like there are places in the world where... As you highlighted, 60% of places are already using this. And to see that it's augmentation rather than automation, but certain tasks are automation as well. Um, And what we see with robotics being introduced, it's really great to hear the staff and workers' experiences in this area. Um, One of the key themes I picked out on that is also the need um, for to innovate and Japan being in that ecosystem where they do have those workforce challenges, um, they push towards and the right mix of having technology, innovation, uh, robot. They've already always been so far ahead in robotics. How do you see this playing out beyond Japan, though? Uh, in countries such as China, where there's no workforce, uh, they might ha- not have the same workforce challenges. Do you see innovation um, taking a different route there, or? trying to where workforce shortage is not a key issue. Do you see this having an impact on translation? Yes, it's an important question to look at going forward. As you said, um, each health system country region is different, particularly in their demographics and the economics of their labor markets um, for healthcare and for long-term care. And even comparing economies that you might think are very similar like um, Japan and Korea, you know, Asia's two OECD countries. Um, They both have long-term care insurance financing for the elderly, but you have widespread adoption in Japan and not much at all in Korea so far for uh, these kinds of robots in nursing homes. And as you so wisely pointed out, a lot has to do with, with labor and, um, You know, we don't know for sure, but we have some hypotheses, particularly in China and Korea, where interestingly, there are many, um, you know, Koreans of Chinese, um, you know, Chinese Koreans who are ethnically Korean originally from China. Um, Some may have moved to Korea or elsewhere might be um, supplementing their work of care um, of the caregiver market. They also have uh, more recent long-term care insurance and um, are not quite as uh, old age structure as Japan yet, although aging even more rapidly. Um, They have much higher adoption of robots in manufacturing, actually, but not so much in long-term care. So there are a lot of specifics about a given economy or health system. And as you know, in China, not only is a much larger country and um, many more Um, caregivers potentially in that market, but there's also not any structured organized financing for long-term care, and it's largely a household responsibility, and to what extent, you know, the daughter-in-law still does everything versus others, and the families are supported in in providing um, services at home or in institutions, and whether use of um, 
robotics would complement or replace those services is something that's going to play out not only in years, but decades to come. And I think actually healthcare and long-term care is a very interesting field to study because as you mentioned, it's about what tasks the technology takes on. It's not that they replace a whole person and a job, but they, they supplement or replace particular tasks. And then the human does other things. And these kind of caregiving uh, professions are places where robots really are never going to be able to replace actual caregiving role, but they can supplement and make some of the tasks easier. And it was great to see the impact on the workforce around reduced back injuries and uh, back pain due to the support the robots were providing them. I see a lot of parallels there between Australia and Japan because of demographically we've got the same set challenges and even the workforce challenges. Have you, in your travels and work, noticed any other use cases in healthcare beyond aged care, such as in hospitals in Japan or anywhere else where these robots are, we do know about the robotic surgeries and the other bits, but is there any other uh, examples you'd like to highlight? Right. Well, there are many examples and no doubt you have or will be talking to many other people that are adopting these new technologies throughout healthcare and its ancillary services. Um, I might just point out that there are many, um, they're not even called robots, but technologies um, embedded within healthcare settings that might help um, with very basic tasks. I mean, I have colleagues here at Stanford who have worked with others in Asia, in the U.S. and elsewhere on something like um, monitoring whether healthcare providers are washing hands before they contact patients. And this is something that that health systems have struggled to sort of find ways to make that a routine part of healthcare. And technology can help with that if they're just in the background. It's sometimes called ambient intelligence, right? That's it's just there built into the care setting in some unobtrusive way that is going to send reminders or otherwise try to um, improve adherence to these practices, which are simple, but we know lead to better outcomes. Um, Of course, that itself leads to controversy. You know, here it's called ambient intelligence, but if it's in China, you know, it's called digital surveillance. So even the the, the terminology is, is different. And um, I think we all have to consciously think about it. Is it the same thing? And how is it being regulated? Our patients' privacy, um, confidentiality, data um, being addressed, those issues. And workers that are afraid of being replaced, is their job security being addressed? Are they um, being upskilled and augmented to be able to use these technologies to enhance the quality of care or are technologies being adopted just to replace workers and they're just not really good technologies. um, So they're not really improving care. So there's still many dimensions of this that um, we still need evidence about what works in which settings. That's interesting because it reminds me of one of your work around capturing value in healthcare and how that um, and one of the key projects currently undertaken by New South Wales Health is around value of healthcare and value-based healthcare delivery um, and the whole sense of capturing what the true value of delivery of, irrespective of how you deliver it, is it deriving the value? Have you seen any regions of automation around capturing patient experiences, patient outcomes in those industries and evaluations in the Japanese setting around the quality of care and what's the experience of the workforce being and the patients being in that area? Well, I think settings, um, many different settings are still figuring this out. The technology is at an early stage and trying to figure out um, to bake in sort of the ethics of adopting technology and rolling it out um, is one thing. And then evaluating it and quantifying its impact is yet another thing. And we're not quite there at a wide enough scale yet for me to have many studies that I can cite to give that information. 
But I think it will be vitally important. We don't just want to have bright, shiny technology just for the sake of having technology. We want to know if it's really leveraging um, our systems, bringing more affordable forms of care to rural or vulnerable populations, improving the quality and the experience of care um, for those who are receiving healthcare procedures or in long-term care settings. So we do have some evidence, you know, that that monitoring for hand washing can be good, that you give reminders for certain kinds of behaviors can be good. Those tend to be in specific settings. You don't always have um, the costs completely captured and it's not entirely clear. I mean, there's one cost of adopting the technology and then training all the workers to use it. And then there's the incremental cost um, going forward of it in operation and what parts of those are captured will make a difference for the net value of the care, as you mentioned. So I think it's a very important area that we have to focus on going forward. And indeed, I mentioned our new survey, we gathered information about various measures of quality of care that we are also going to analyze to look at whether robot adoption had an impact on those. And I might mention that although we found some favorable effects on staffing, there's also a finding that the wages of regular nurses was lower. And so it's not entirely clear if that means that they were putting in fewer hours on long night shifts, which could be an improvement, or maybe um, nursing homes are shifting towards these non-regular workers and the regular full-time workers um, you know, are suffering. It's not clear if the reduction in hours um, you know, compensates for the reduction in wages. So all of these things I think have to be monitored carefully going forward to figure out if it really is delivering value and for which tasks in which settings. It's interesting you highlight that because time and again we implement novel technologies, um, but it seems that the systems that evaluate them are never truly digitized enough to capture the value that it's delivering. It's the same as when we implemented the EMRs or digital health records. We're never able to capture the true value until a few years later. But uh, sometimes you just have to do things because it's the right thing to do. And sometimes you'd have to stop doing things because it's not the right thing to do, just like the hand washing example you highlighted. Um, are there some, any specific, I, I noticed that, you know, one of the, the net value um, discussion you just had and your work in diabetes and chronic diseases in, in the developing countries. Do, do you, how do you see that playing out into the future? Because um, knowing the chronic disease burden increasing across most of the OECD countries, and it's it's the number one problem for Australia as well. I think something like 80% of our healthcare is consumed by 5% of the population with chronic disease. Um, how do you see that playing out in the new age of robotics and healthcare and automation? Well, I think it's increasingly an area where uh, policymakers in society are going to be demanding that we measure and shape our policies towards better ways of measuring value, productivity, and outcomes. As we all know, our populations don't necessarily value um, health care itself so much as health and living a long, healthy life. But we usually pay for a specific procedure rather than for improving the health outcome of that patient. And there's a reason for that. As you know, it's very difficult to figure out what is the value added of a given provider because, you know, some providers will be serving sicker patients than other providers. And you have to adjust for, you know, the severity of the patient when they walked in the door, not just what happened when they walked out the door. And that's challenging to do. But I think we have to do it. If we're going to have a system that really rewards um, individuals, organizations, and, um, you know, whole systems of care with what we really value as a society, then we have to measure that and reward it 
right? There's that famous um, article in the management, you know, on the folly of, um, you know, measuring A and hoping for B, because that's what we do is, you know, we measure the number of visits you have and call that productivity, where what we really want to measure is, are you controlling the hemoglobin I want to see of this data by these patients so that their risk of stroke 10 years from now goes down. And so that's one thing I've been working with colleagues to try to develop these metrics for value. And um, it's challenging because you need data, not just on healthcare use or spending, you need clinical measures all in one data set, but more, more of this data is becoming available and just as right now, when policymakers discuss life expectancy, people will say, well, what about quality adjusted life expectancy or healthy life expectancy? I think in, over the next five, 10 years, people will say, okay, you told me about spending. What about quality adjusted spending? And we're going to have to be able to answer that question also. Yeah, and, and, and look, and, and that it's my me talking to people like you because uh, I've also read a bit of audio work around risk, risk adjustment in healthcare funding. And one of the key things you highlight there, which is this big challenge for all of us, I've always believed that healthcare industries are in the business of illness, not in the business of health. Our models were always designed to treat illness and that's why the models and the evaluation was around the outcomes of what happened to the illness rather than what happened to the person and as we shift from that illness model to health model hospitals are about sick people not about healthy people but bringing those data points together is going to be a significant challenge into the future um, and and honestly i think uh, it's the great work from people like you with the thought leaders where we seek guidance for the systems to ahead from. Karen, one of the points you highlighted around the use case in Japan was how the robots impacted the workforce and how it augmented and also the perceived or you're still evaluating the potential negative impacts it had. Uh, do you have any insight on how to prepare a workforce for the change that's coming up? And do you see what uh, training requirements and also in the health policy and policy side, what do you see as few things new systems like Australia or any other countries planning to take on this would be facing and would need to do to be proactively um, to make best use of the robotics in healthcare? Right. Well, thank you for the question. It won't surprise you to hear that one of the key answers my colleagues and I believe in is education and lifelong learning, because for many reasons, um, and the constant innovations and in technologies being a primary one, um, we really need to prepare our workforce starting at a young age, learning how to develop an analytic mind, but also to be adaptable and to be open to uh, renewing our knowledge and adapting to the new technologies over time. And as the workforce ages, we need to think of ways that creatively meet the needs of different parts of the workforce that involves a lifelong learning process and draws on the comparative advantage of people with more experience, but maybe um, more obsolescence in some of their original skills. And then learning from them about um, the tasks that automation can help to fill in a productive way. And then using those same technologies to monitor to see if we really are having an impact. And related to that, one reason why education is so important is because it also addresses the huge issues of inequalities and disparities that we see throughout our societies and economies but also, of course, in terms of health disparities. Yeah, and it's just, it's interesting how education plays out and the health force, uh, health workforce maturity comes into play as well because it will be interesting to see what happens in the future because not every person who works as a doctor or a nurse or a physiotherapist is alike. And whilst we want this whole workforce to be that ever-learning community, there will be certain groups who would want to and would won't want to. So do you see that impact on the workforce and 
different varying levels of automation in a single occupation and then people taking on roles where they're more comfortable to work with this and it's already happening um in healthcare um it's more of a statement rather than a question but i think it's uh, it, it will be a very interesting time ahead um well i think you were right about um many different um occupations and tasks being affected in different ways and as you know much of our workforce is moving towards a team based model yeah. and this will be very important going forward as well that you have different expertise coming together and part of that expertise will be about how ai and robotics um and the ethics of guaranteeing patient privacy and confidentiality while implementing that technology interacts with um, the specific clinical um, tasks and needs and experience in a given part of our health sector. And so I think that that also raises the bar for monitoring impact, right? Because then you're not only trying to figure out the net value of a given individual, but a team and what each person um, provided to the value of the team outcome in terms of health outcomes for our patients. So it is very important that we all work together and have teams that draw upon disparate expertise, but then we have to think about how we're going to reward people. Um, if you have a uh, nurse or a social worker at the back of the room that has vital information that the surgeon needs, but doesn't feel empowered to say that, then health outcomes will not be optimized. Um, so we need to think about that team-based uh, learning while we monitor and reward value. Yeah, and I agree. And I think as the work of clinicians changes and the roles that a doctor conducts, um, I can almost see uh, the doctor's role being more of a consulting and holding hands of the patient and then and a, almost an overlap between the team members' roles, which currently does occur because um, with the way AI is adopted, uh, a lot of the diagnostics which the clinicians currently do may change into the future because it would be more about playing that interpreter role between technology and the patient rather than driving the decision making we may be far off on that but um, it's it's this is it will be a very interesting space to keep an eye out on and um, you know uh, things have changed so much in the last 20 years as well of us working as a clinician now and starting from paper records to electronic records and to actually be popping up with alerts um, it will be an interesting transition moving forward one of the things that recently changes the obviously the covid pandemic and um, you clearly have uh, published and written a lot around that topic as well and now economies and countries have been impacted by this pandemic do you see that changing the trajectory of what the future would have looked like 3 years ago to what it is what it would look like now or is it just a rapid transition or do you think this pandemic has really had an impact on what the future would look like for the future of work and workforce and healthcare well thank you for that question the pandemic is certainly such a vitally important um, event in all of our lifetimes that we know it will have implications near and far um, and the total excess mortality from the event and impact on everyday lives varies according to what health system what geography you are in right now but overall it certainly underscores for one thing how interconnected we are on this planet and how you know people halfway around the globe and what's happening to them can directly impact us and that our whole social and economic life in some sense is built upon the resilience of our health systems and that's not always appreciated as much unfortunately it might take something like a pandemic to reinforce that point but one can hope that societies will realize that we really need to invest in strong and resilient health systems 
to cope with these kind of events and to build back better, to use that techno- um, that terminology going forward. And so one can hope that um, the pandemic will not only accelerate certain trends, such as adoption of telemedicine where possible um, and productive working from home and allowing people to either move back to more remote areas or have more access to care from more remote areas, but also to inspire a deeper rethink about our healthcare systems and how we can adopt technologies to add value. Of course, the problem is that the pandemic is at the same time when we need to invest more in health systems, the pandemic means we have a recession and many people out of work and severe uh, fiscal constraints on those very investments that we now realize are so vitally important. So those will play out differently over time. And I just hope that, you know, five, 10 years from now, we won't forget and then underinvest in public health again and have the same kind of terribly inequitable outcomes from the next crisis that hits. So we can hope that we've all learned about the economic and social value of building stronger health systems and that that will um, be recognized well into the future. And I can see, you know, it's it is a it's challenging as you highlighted that the pandemic whilst creates that burning platform to make the changes in healthcare, it also has the impact on the other sectors, which then makes it very hard to balance it out to make those investment in healthcare into the future. And also is highlighted that each of those systems, such as we've always tried to look at healthcare in a isolated bubble and then you look at social and psychosocial and economic things in their own little groups and sections and how a large disaster which in one sector it's just like an economic crisis can have a significant impact on the healthcare trajectory of a country or an economy as well so it's that crossover which has a significant impact and it will be really interesting to see how this plays out and this space comes out and while you'd love that the future is better prepared for the next pandemic or we can actually control it before it becomes a pandemic i'd hope um and and we don't have to get to that point but prevention is probably going to be a great investment to make into the future one of the things you talked about around risk risk adjustments and uh, one of the other works you've done is around the mortality rates and the different differing mortality rates in different genders and and age and socioeconomic characteristics in healthcare have you seen over time those trends change because i think you've written on this as well around how it gets worse and then gets better in economies as well and Whereas some of the research I've done has, has shown that, that, you know, in certain situation, the female gender and elderly population to receive um, suboptimal care or suboptimal outcomes because of the way the healthcare has been designed. Um, so a lot of our algorithms and a lot of our prediction tools are based on the 70 kilogram middle-aged male which may be significantly different from females and elderly population, whilst they are increasingly resilient. What does your work in that area, shown? Well, that's a huge question. I don't pretend to have all the answers to that. Um, as you pointed out, I have done some research with colleagues that looks, um, for example, at differences in mortality rates for specific conditions and gender differences across different health systems um, in those changes in mortality rates from different conditions. And um, there is this paradox, as you know, that life expectancy of women in in almost any larger population measure tends to be higher 
but they suffer from more um, morbidities at a given point in time. And we actually found in our research that this gender gap in life expectancy, or to the extent you can do quality adjusted life expectancy, varies across health systems and over time in certain um, predictable ways, but sometimes surprising. And, you know, some have to do with um, trends in major causes of death, like cardiovascular disease, control of earlier scourges of infectious disease, um, and some with behaviors, like we know we have very high male smoking rates in East Asia, um, which would be partly driving some of that remaining gender gap or where why places um, such as Japan are not closing the gender gap as much as some other places in the world are. It's not entirely clear why. So you just guess which country in the world has the smallest gap between male and female life expectancy in the past few years. Any guesses there? Sweden. <laughs> oh, Excellent <Scandinavian>. guess. <laughs> it depends which year you look at, but it's Iceland. Oh. So, you know, what exactly it is about a specific health setting, it's not always immediately apparent. At the same time, if you go back, you know, more than a century and look at the country with the world's leading life expectancy, you find some of the same names coming up as you do at countries that have handled the current pandemic well. Um, you know, Australia and New Zealand, for example, and Sweden, Norway, um, and Japan. So obviously the impact of the pandemic is one thing and there are many reasons for that. And long-term trends in healthy life expectancy, there are many reasons for that as well. Um, gender differences are so important right now because it's part of the inequality and the impact of the pandemic. I know you in Australia still have kids in school, but we working women with children mm. have been working full-time from home with children at school or being cared for at home. Um, and this varies across health systems. And building back better will also be part of whether we're going to try to facilitate those changes um, to allow, um, you know, whole societies to say that a parent can be a very present, full-time, productive worker as a woman, as well as a man. And it's not yes. just all the mother's responsibility. Um, but that varies across societies, obviously. And some places have very low retirement ages, like China's experimenting with raising its retirement ages. But then what about the grandmothers that are providing all the child care for the younger women who are at work? Right? There's a whole social contract that's involved in families and societies as this um the economies uh, change and the health systems also change, right? Whether there's organized financing for daycare and elder care, or it's expected to be the daughter-in-law and the mother-in-law. So depending on the setting, those um, vary a lot. One thing that I found with colleague Victor Fuchs and others is that almost everywhere you look, that women tend to be more resilient to socioeconomic um, deprivation than men do. So you have very large um, disparities in, in male outcomes, like the transition from central planning to markets. A lot of that increase in mortality was more focused among men than women and in other contexts. But that doesn't mean we don't have huge disparities going forward that we, and the intersection of gender with race and ethnicity and other issues will be very important for our systems to try to address. Yeah. And as it's the social construct of a society, which is defined today and the roles that it provides and the gender specificity of some of those roles then defines what impact it will have on the future workforce as well as in so those disparities as you could see in the past of a predominantly female work for a nursing workforce versus a medical workforce was predominantly male as well but you can see that change as we change our systems and um, as it's not just the disparities in healthcare outcomes but also in the disparity of all the social constructs we need to work upon to get to that future workforce where that is not existent anymore. Right. Well, um, 
I might be considered a pathological optimist, but just to end on a more hopeful note about that, we've been talking about AI and technologies and so on and the need for lifelong learning. And one of my hypotheses is that since we're going to need to re-educate ourselves every decade or so, maybe there'll be less of a penalty for taking time out to parent um, when the kids are little and then retraining because everybody's going to need retraining. So as my colleagues Claudia Golden in economics and in other fields sociology have pointed out, one of the issues is that time flexibility of the workforce and who's providing care for the children or um, the frail elderly. And if technologies enable retraining at regular intervals or regularize the idea of an encore career, then maybe we can navigate these issues of population aging of the overall workforce and taking time for family while allowing for parents of both genders to have same kind of career opportunities. Maybe there'll be ways of leveraging technology to address those disparities rather than to make them worse. That'll be an amazing future workforce and a future of work to look at in the workplace as well. Thank you so much uh, for today's chat, Karen. Um, thanks for making the time and adjusting your diary around. Thank us, you. Us. Yeah, I hope some of that's useful. Perfect. Thank you so much. I'll let you go around with your day and I'm sure hopefully we'll cross paths again. So that's all we have time for this episode. Thanks for joining me on the show. If you enjoyed the podcast, make sure to like, share and subscribe on whatever platform you are on right now. 